Hey guys, I want to thank Jay Nightmares for sourcing some of these stories. I hope you enjoy. When I was in high school, I used to take these late night baths, usually at around 2am. My classmate and childhood best friend lived next door to me, so sometimes we would stay up super late at his house, and then when I got home I would take my bath and get to sleep. I used to sneak out to go over to his house. My parents didn't know I was up that late. Our bathroom is on the bottom floor, which is why I was able to take late night baths without waking the whole house up. So one night, I snuck out as usual to go over to his house for another night of gaming, and just before 2am, I snuck back in and headed for the bathroom. I was going about my business as quietly as possible. While I was in the bath, I heard a scream. I knew that scream. It was my friend's scream. It scared the hell out of me, but before I started to panic, I let the logical side of my brain kick in. What's wrong? Did you see a cockroach or something? I wondered. But then I heard another noise. There was now a banging sound coming from next door. It sounded like it was one of the shutters on the window. What the hell? Was someone out there? I thought. Just as my heart rate began to rise, the noises stopped. Concern replaced panic. I was genuinely worried. After a few moments of silence, I heard another noise. It sounded like one of the trees close to my friend's house was now swaying. I had heard them make this noise during heavy winds and typhoons, but never on a night like that. There was a dense tree line between our two families' properties. It usually helped hide me when I snuck out, but now it sounded like it was hiding something else. It wasn't even windy out. Then, after a while, the trees near our house started shaking like crazy too. Panic was back. Whatever scared the hell out of my friend seemed to be very close to our house. I heard the tree that was closest to the bathroom shaking and knew that that tree overlooked the bathroom. I was thinking that it could be a wild animal or something. Either way, I needed to get out of the bath. I felt very defenseless in there. I got out and put a towel around myself and slowly approached the window. I looked out and I couldn't see anything as it was dark and the bathroom was a bit steamy too. I wanted to know what was out there. I needed to know. So I did something dumb. I opened the bathroom window. The second I opened the window and looked up, I saw a pair of eyes staring at me. There was a woman halfway up our tree glaring at me wide-eyed. Her face seemed unusually pale and she was expressionless. It was as if I was looking at a living mannequin. She had short hair and she was wearing a dark raincoat. Seconds or perhaps minutes passed. We were just looking at one another. My feet felt as if they were frozen to the floor. I felt as if I couldn't look away. Like a deer in headlights. Then a drop of water fell from the faucet into the bath with a loud splash and that brought me back to reality. I screamed at the top of my lungs and scrambled to close the window. Once the window was shut, I locked it. I heard the sound of the tree's branches and leaves moving, and then I heard a thick, heavy thud land outside on the ground, just beyond the window. The woman was right there, behind the window. Only a thin layer of glass separated us. She stood there and stared that stony-faced stare at me. She raised a finger and began to tap on the glass. I backed away from the window towards the bathroom door. The taps grew into knocks, and the knocks grew into thumps. Before long, she was hammering on the window. I thought that it would break. It was at that point I heard my dad shout something from the upstairs window. I opened the bathroom door and got out of there. My body felt ice cold. I stood there in my towel, shaking and terrified. My dad went outside, but before he got downstairs, the woman was already gone. 
The next day at school, I asked my friend what he saw, and he confirmed that he saw the expressionless woman banging on his window too. He said that the woman was singing in a quiet voice, Open the window, open the window. I was scared for days after that. She haunted my dreams. We quit the late night gaming sessions, and I never took a bath that late again. Even as an adult, I don't like to be in the bathroom at night for extended periods. She never came back, but I don't think I can ever get her expressionless face out of my memories. It was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. This happened one Saturday night. I got into a huge fight with my mom, and it was very emotional and intense to say the least. We made up, said goodnight to each other, blah blah blah, but I was still pissed. So my impulsive self decided I was going to take off for the night. I just wanted to cool off. I went into the backyard and hopped over one of our walls and started to walk around. For a bit of a layout in my story, down the street from my house, there's a church and a preschool across from it. In front of the preschool, there are large, tall hedges that sort of hide the pick-up and drop-off point that's in front of the school. There's a stop sign on the church's corner before the busy main road and a street lamp on the same corner. I made my way down to the corner of that church's side. I was very bored and cold but it's not like I could call a friend to pick me up and hang out for the rest of the night. I decided to face the main road and put a hitchhiker's thumb up in hopes of someone pulling into the street and letting me use their phone to call a friend. After what felt like forever, I was getting no luck, and then I saw a guy from across the main road, and I called for him. I didn't have any weird feelings about him. He was harmless and he let me use his phone but I still wasn't able to find any of my friends to come and get me. Before he left, he asked if I had a knife on me or something. I said, Honestly, I forgot mine at home. He handed me a small but very sharp switchblade and told me to keep it, to stay safe, and to have a good night. After watching him walk into the darkness heading east, I wandered up and down the sidewalk as cars passed by often. I started to pass the hedges, and I glanced over to the left of me, where the school was. I saw a large silhouette of a man, slowly creeping around in front of the doors to the small preschool. He was tall and looked like he was strong. Broad shoulders, too. It took me a millisecond to realize he stopped and saw me, too. I went into flight mode and immediately noped the hell out of there. I ran across the busy street because it was empty at the moment, and I kept sprinting until I was five streets down and realized he wasn't following me. About thirty minutes had gone by, and I decided it was time to make my way home. I eventually crossed the street and was facing the main road, walking down to the church and take a left to get home. It was silent and no cars had gone by for a few minutes at that point. Then I heard a car speeding down the road, and I turned my head back to see it was a large, white suburban. I dismissed it, thinking nothing of it, as it turned right a few streets down across the road. I started to turn the corner under the street lamp when I looked back up again, and saw it was starting to come out of the same road it had just turned into. I'm not sure why or how my gut was telling me to run, but I did. I ran into the parking lot of the church and started to see headlights turn into the street. I threw myself onto the ground behind a ramp wall that was barely tall enough to hide me. Next thing I know, I'm about to cry because of how freaked out I was, while trying to stay silent at the same time. Because the Suburban's headlight reflected off the walls of the building as it pulled into the parking lot, it made a few laps from what I could sneak a peek of and stopped in the middle for a couple of minutes 
before it turned out and drove into the main road. I waited it out a bit longer and pulled the knife out, listening for anything and everything. Once I realized I was probably in the clear, I ran back home. I'm not sure what exactly was going on. This happened when I moved out to the west of Tokyo. The apartment I moved into was about two years old. It was a very ordinary looking place. I lived on the second floor in the last apartment on the left. Back in those days, I was free and single. I was working freelance and I barely left my apartment. I would only have to leave to go to meetings. It was pretty hard back then with an unstable income with rent piling up. I was stressed. I guess from the outside, I looked like someone with a ton of time on my hands. It might have even looked as if I was unemployed. I was just perpetually wandering around the apartment block. I was always there. To be honest, I sensed some prejudice about my lifestyle from the landlord from the moment I moved in. When I moved in, I bought some cakes and thought I'd stop by and introduce myself to the neighbors. I let them know I was at home even in the daytime if they needed anything. I guessed I hoped that would make them conscious of my home and work life, and that would perhaps encourage them to, I don't know, keep it down a little while I was working. So I went to the apartment next to mine first. Next door was a couple. The guy was a blue collar worker. He was in construction and his wife also was working. They were a nice young couple. They were good neighbors and never caused me any trouble. I got along with them, and without sounding mean, they were the best type of neighbors you could hope for since they were so ordinary. Next, I thought I would pay a visit to whoever was living downstairs, but they weren't home. No matter how many times I went down there, there was no one home. At first, I thought that the apartment was vacant but something changed to make me think otherwise. The apartment complex wasn't exactly cheap, but noises from the neighbors could be heard. I mean, I would always know when someone was watching TV too loudly. I heard noise coming from downstairs, footsteps, and everyday household noises. When I heard this kind of noise, I went down there to introduce myself, but no one answered the door. I got the strangest feeling that someone was watching me through the peephole. I mean, I can't be certain, but it felt like that. I can understand if someone is out, but to constantly pretend that you're not home when someone comes to the door is a bit weird, I guess. According to the landlord, the people who lived downstairs were another young couple. The guy was an office worker, and his wife was a housewife. It was obvious that they were ignoring me when I rang their doorbell, and that annoyed me. Then finally, a full week after I'd moved in, I saw their door open as I was passing on the stairs. I thought, great, I finally get a chance to see this stubborn asshole. I was surprised to see a timid, nervous-looking man scuttling towards his door. He wasn't what I expected. As the door opened... I saw his wife standing in the kitchen. She saw me and looked my way. I guess she must have recognized me from the peephole. She was short and plump with a dated short hairstyle. She was holding a baby close to her chest and she was wearing an apron. I gave her a slight nod to say hello, but I couldn't keep eye contact with her. She was staring at me with a blank expression. On reflection... I now understand why she was so reluctant to answer the door. She was home alone with a newborn, and I was a total stranger. I thought I would just leave them alone. I didn't want to come across as creepier, and I felt bad to have been bothering them so much. Life in my new apartment went on peacefully from that day for a while. I was engrossed in my work one afternoon when I heard a thud coming from below. It felt and sounded like someone downstairs jabbed a pole or a stick against my floor. 
A couple of raps came in quick succession. It was as if I was being told to keep it down. I wasn't making any noise or listening to any music though. It sounded angry. The floor wasn't exactly thick, so with the power behind the jabs that were hitting it, I thought it wouldn't be long before it would create a hole. The intervals between each blast were getting shorter and shorter. What the hell was this? When I listened a bit more closely, I heard that there were other sounds coming from downstairs. It sounded as if something heavy was being thrown against the wall too. There was some muttering too, and then all the crashing and banging sounds ceased. This all happened on a weekday at lunchtime. It didn't sound like a domestic argument since I guessed that guy was at work. It honestly sounded directed at me as if I'd been making noises, which I hadn't. Well, the banging against my floor wasn't one-off, unfortunately. It happened a lot. Sometimes I would hear cupboards and doors slam down there too. The noises from downstairs always happened on weekday times and never on the weekends. They never lasted long, but they sounded very aggressive. I guess that because I was the only person working at home at the time, I was the only one who heard them. I got the strong impressions, based on my interactions with the landlord, that if I complained about these outbursts, then I would be further ostracized. I knew that he would think of me as just some young guy looking for areas to complain about. I knew he would stereotype me as a lazy student just because I was working in an unconventional way. The noise from downstairs wasn't daily, but it was frequent. The sounds which were coming out of her mouth from down there were really disturbing. It was like she was speaking some long, dead language. It didn't make sense. It sounded as if it was from the pit of her stomach. It sounded like guttural sounds leaking out from gritted teeth. Before I knew it, strange moans and screams rose from below, and the banging and slamming got worse. Enough was enough. I decided to call the landlord and tell him about what was going on. Just as I expected, he brushed off my comments by saying, Well, no one else has said anything. I knew he lived on the outside of town, so I couldn't imagine he would be interested in coming over, unless something was absolutely urgent. I didn't care that nobody else had said anything. I said something. I hated his attitude. One day, her noise was really ridiculous, so I went downstairs and pretended to get something from my car, and then tried to sneak a peek into their apartment. Their curtains were closed, so I couldn't see anything. Then, all of a sudden, it was as if she sensed my presence because she stopped her banging and screaming. I learned something while I was down there, that her screams were not screams of anger or irritation, but they were just nonsensical, and that really creeped me out. I thought she was a complete weirdo, but I couldn't help myself. From that day forward, I continued to listen to her. I would even hold my breath to try and make out what she was screaming about. I couldn't decipher any words I understood, but then after a while, I don't know how many days or weeks, but I was able to make out something. You spoiled brat. You make me so mad. I could kill you. I couldn't help but think of that baby she was holding tightly to her chest, and my heart wept. Could this be abuse? I heard other things I dare not repeat, but the gist of it is that she was angry that the baby wasn't eating. Is this why she'd been screaming and banging around down there? I knew I needed to report it, but I needed to get my story straight and at least gather some evidence of what I assumed to be going on down there. I didn't want to cause a fuss if I wasn't going to be listened to, and given the attitude of my landlord, I was more apprehensive than I should have been. While I was mulling this over, a jarring thought burst to the forefront of my mind, and that was, why haven't I ever heard the baby crying? I was really worried now. I felt so helpless, but I knew I needed to do something. 
Then, moments later, I heard a different sound. I crept out of my apartment and looked down from the top of the corridor stairs. A moving truck was idling its engine in the communal parking lot. I guessed that her husband or someone was moving out. My theory was confirmed when I looked out the window to see him carrying a cardboard box to the truck. His wife wasn't helping with the boxes. She was just stood there staring an absent stare beside what I assumed was their family car. Her hair looked oily. She looked as if she hadn't washed for a while. Her shoulders were slumped and she seemed to be unaware of her surroundings. She was wearing the same apron I saw her wearing the last time I saw her. There was her baby, still pulled tightly to her chest. I couldn't see everything from where I was, but at least the baby looked okay. I wondered if my imagination had run away from me. Back then, I didn't know anything about raising a baby or their situation. I saw the baby in her arms, opening and closing its eyes. I was so relieved that the baby was okay. I caught a better glimpse of the baby's face, and I was shocked to see that its expression was similar to its mother's, completely blank. Something felt wrong here, but like I said, I didn't know their situation, and I felt really bad for judging them if they were going through a tough time. Before long, their truck was loaded and they were ready to depart. I don't know why I kept watching them, but I did. Her husband called her over to the truck, and she approached. And that's when I saw something that changed everything. When she was climbing into the car, she bumped the side of her baby's head against the door frame. I knew that her husband saw it. There was no way that he didn't. I was so angry in that moment, I began storming downstairs and into the parking lot. Then, as I drew closer to their car, the baby's face was reflected in the sunlight and its eyes gleamed. The only part of that baby that was moving was its eyelids, and that only happened when she moved her arms. I knew then that it wasn't a baby. It was obviously a doll and I'm so thankful that it was. I really discovered a love for walking over lockdown. There were days where I could spend hours out traveling the country roads, across fields and through the woods. I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Ireland so the walks were a great form of exercise without using a gym. It started with me and my dad going out for about an hour every day, but he knew I wanted more and told me to go on my own if he wasn't up for it or if I wanted to go further than usual. It was around July of 2021. I was 14 at the time, and even though lockdown was starting to ease, I still went walking. I decided to walk through the fields instead of the roads because having to stop for cars really irks me. I came to a plot of land with trees planted and decided to splash the boots before turning back. I was almost finished when I started hearing laughter from behind me. I pulled up my zip and buckled my belt to face whoever was there. I was surprised to see five people. None of them could have been much older than me. One of them waved and I walked towards them. They were between me and my way back home, so I sort of had to. The group had been talking amongst themselves, but stopped when I met them. There were three boys and two girls. They all had bags or backpacks and were all similarly dressed in dark graphic t-shirts and black cargos with funny looking keychains. A bit of a weird sight, considering things like skate culture aren't really big where I'm from, and anyone who's ever owned a nice piece of clothing wouldn't wear it out in a place where they could trip up and cowpat. The guy with the Thrasher t-shirt smiled and asked, What are you doing out here? I realized it must have been a bit weird to meet a stranger in the absolute asshole of nowhere, so I just said, I'm taking a shortcut through the back road. Another boy chimes in and said, 
don't lie, Colchi. When I saw you taking a piss in the woods, it dawned on me that they were both too well-spoken to be anyone local. I felt a bit intimidated, so I just told him. Nature was calling, as jokingly as I could, to which they all laughed. I wasn't sure if it was my accent that they found funny, or the fact that they'd caught me and I was made visibly embarrassed. One of the two girls breaks from the laughter and pulls a face of disgust. Oh, for fuck's sake, what are you doing with that necklace? Referring to the cross necklace I was wearing. It didn't really scan with me how serious she was, so I just let out a chuckle. But the four others stopped laughing. The girl who spoke pulled out a book from the tote bag she'd worn over her shoulder, and she said, You've probably already ruined this by pissing on the ground too. As if I was supposed to know what this was. The five of them all genuinely looked gutted, as if I genuinely ruined their day. I just responded with, I don't really know what you mean. And a bleeding noise came out from the thrasher guy's bag. I looked at him, and the group starts to act skittish. The girl with the book says, Let's just look for a good spot, and they walk past me. I turn and see the thrasher guy's backpack look sort of lumpy. At the time, I really didn't know what was in there, but as I was nearly home, I walked past a field with sheep, and I realized they stole an animal from one of the farms. I told my parents later that day I was away cycling, I took the bike as far as I could and jogged to where I last saw the group disappear into the trees. I looked around. There was a dead lamb with several shallow gashes all over it, with some of its wool almost pulled out. The number five and blue spray paint was still partially visible. I'm guessing that they left it there after cutting it, and it bled out and died. I don't believe in that satanic, panic antichrist thing, but I know they were probably sacrificing the lamb for some reason or the other. I was helping my friend, who I told this story to, with farmhand work the week after, and all of his livestock were accounted for, meaning I have a rough idea of which field they got the lamb, but I didn't want to ask the owner, in case he thought I had something to do with it disappearing. Me and my friend went back to the wooded area because I didn't want him to think I was messing with them, but I haven't gone back since. This was around 2009. I was about 11 or 12. I live in Rhode Island, which is pretty small, and lived very sheltered. I got my first laptop around this time. Every day after school, my group of friends and I would log into AIM and talk about school, boys, you know, usual middle school things. I don't know if any of you remember, but there was AIM public groups where you could meet strangers. That's where my story begins. A group of my friends and I went into a public AIM group, just being stupid, making jokes, sharing YouTube videos. One guy takes a certain interest in me and he adds me so we can talk privately. I don't remember what we talked about. School. Anime. About my friends. Looking back, I think he was grooming me, but nothing seemed off about it then. He was 32 years old. I can't remember his name for the life of me. He lived in the neighboring state of Connecticut, which isn't too far. I'd hoped to meet him since he was really nice to me, I was young and was being bullied in school, so anyone online seemed like an escape. He and I talked about Vocaloid. It wasn't as popular back then, but I was so excited to have a friend who liked what I did. Things had gone by normal for a while. I used to do YouTube videos, and he subscribed to my old account. I even showed him a song called Luca Luca Night Fever. He put it into his favorites. I was so happy. But one day, he began being different. He asked me to call on the phone. I was one of the only kids in my class who didn't have a cell phone, 
and I didn't want my family to catch me on the house phone with a stranger. I politely said, I can't, sorry. And to this day, I remember his answer. Call me, or I'll assault and murder you. I was sheltered like I said. I panicked. My throat clenched up and I threw up. I blocked him immediately. I should have called the cops. I should have told my mom. But I didn't. I was so afraid that I'd done something wrong that they wouldn't take me seriously, that I would have my computer taken away. He knew I was 11 or 12. As soon as he'd realized what I'd done, he sent AIM spam bots on me. It was to the point where it crashed my computer. They all had obscene sexual names. I made a new account on AIM and pretty much forgot about him. I log onto YouTube one day and I see I have a message. Expecting it to be my friend from Sweden, I get excited and quickly open it. My heart sinks. It's him. I still remember his YouTube. He's still active on it today. He says something along the lines of, Hey, my cousin got that Volcanoid program. Miku Hatsune. Unblock me, and I can send you a copy. I knew that I couldn't ever forgive what he said. I was scared of him. I didn't block him on YouTube though. I'm not sure why. I don't know if I knew how to block back then. The messages keep coming, but I never answer them. They're all, I miss you so much, I'm sorry. At one point I think he said he loves me. I eventually lose interest in my YouTube account since it was under my real initials and last name. I make one under a fake name to protect myself. I had a lot more subscribers on my old account, so I decided to log in and upload a video saying I was back. This was three or four years ago. The minute I do, I get a message from him. I missed you, baby. You are so beautiful. I check his YouTube channel. There's that damn song, Luca Luca Night Fever, featured on his page. I delete the messages. I delete every video. Every time I get a message request on Facebook, YouTube, or anything, I get anxious and worried it's him. To this day, I've never gone to Connecticut no matter how much I want to. I'm always afraid he'll recognize my face and approach me. I used to be a district court prosecutor in my rural county. Sometimes it's stressful, but almost always entertaining. To set the scene, on a normal court day, I would call 40 or so scheduled cases before the judge for things like charges of plea, sentencing, probation, violations, and other matters. With 40 defendants, onlookers, police, court personnel, and a gaggle of lawyers, it was always barely controlled chaos. I always tried to make it as efficient as possible by calling cases that would take the least time first. Occasionally an attorney would whisper in my ear that their client needed to be called quickly. If they didn't abuse the privilege, I would accommodate. Usually their client had health issues, needed to pick up kids and that kind of thing. The day in question, I was at the start of the docket and I heard a ruckus through the doors to the hallway. Not common, but also not unheard of. A lawyer comes up and says his client's case needs to be handled right away. No other explanation. Enter the meth addict. I've been doing the job long enough to recognize the signs of its use. This guy had all of them. Scrawny guy with small open wounds on his face. Sunken cheeks. Darting eyes. The whole enchilada. I called his case. The guy's obviously physically tense, extremely agitated, and overly loud. Great. He's on meth right now. Flashback. Unbeknownst to me, he'd been wandering around the building with no shirt on, 
shouting nonsense to inmates behind the security windows. The security deputies knew he was a problem, so Deputy X escorted him into the courtroom. The scene of the crime. Deputy X stations himself between the addict and the judge's bench. The addict starts shouting and cursing, and the newly elected judge is having trouble keeping order. The shouting continues, and he starts telling the judge, Fuck you. Fuck the police. While coming around the table. Deputy X is 220 pounds of middle-aged country boy. Body armor. Weapons and gear. This isn't his first rodeo. He tells the guy to step back and shut up. He complies, then strangely calmly pours himself a glass of water from the table. We talk about his case a little more, and he ramps back up in agitation and comes around the table again. Deputy X steps up to him, and the addict throws a glass of water in Deputy X's face. Deputy X looks like a bear that had just been poked with a stick. True to form, he bear hugs the water assailant and gets him cuffed surprisingly quickly, considering the thrashing and yelling. He begins manhandling the guy out of jail for felony assault on an LEO and calls for backup. Deputy X and Deputy Y get him out of the courtroom, and I continue on with another day in courtroom 2. The attempted swan dive onto Marvel. This part was later relayed to me by Deputy Y. After getting him out of the courtroom, Deputy X and Y are dragging the guy past the balcony that overlooks a 20-foot drop onto a wide marble staircase. He rears up and attempts to flip all three of them off the balcony. It's 130 pounds of meth-fueled rage against 400 pounds of deputies that don't feel like having their heads bashed in after a swan dive into marble. Deputy Y sweeps the guy's legs and he does his best impression of a pancake with 400 pounds of pissed off deputy on top of him. It's honestly amazing no bones were broken. Then they escort him to booking, and here's the aftermath. After two weeks in big boy timeout, thinking about what a naughty boy he's been, the guy returns to court under the watchful eye of Deputy X. He'd already been charged in superior court for felony assault on an LEO, the bailiff had thoughtfully removed the water pitcher from the table. The guy is much better behaved this time. As I talk to the judge about his case, I casually pour a glass of water on my separate table and gently nudge it in the direction of the attic. But it's well out of his reach. I lock eyes with Deputy X, and with a stone face, he gently shakes his head. No. After court, Deputy X in private says, you asshole, with a laugh. Innocent is plausible, I said. What? You look thirsty. In the end, the guy pled down the felony assault to a misdemeanor and did some time for it. As far as I know, he's still out there doing shirtless things. Thanks for listening. I hoped you enjoyed a little slice of my life as a rural prosecutor. Hey guys, I want to thank Jay Nightmares again for sourcing and translating some of these stories. Head over to his channel and check out some of his content, his link can be found down below. I also want to say a huge thank you to you guys, because we've now reached 50,000 subscribers. It wouldn't have been possible without each and every one of you. So thanks again guys, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Chris and Donna, Monica Level Ace, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, 
Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ula La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.